Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Beer and Bastards, episode seven, apparently. We've managed to last by six episodes to our seventh episode, and look at who we've got back with us. It's Will Riccardella. Will, back from his stay in the hospital light, he had a really bad case of the crabs, I heard, the clap as well. Um, looks like they didn't have to shave off the beards to get the crabs out. How do they do that? Oh, I, uh, you know, there's this that lice, special lice stuff that I still had from about third grade. I just gave that a once over. I'm pretty good now. I mean, it's That's reduced. Good. Well, you might as well, you might want to hang on to that. You hang out with some pretty sketchy people. Um, says here you're the admin of the analytical conservative, and uh, oh, this is new. Admin at Unbiased America. Now, how'd oh. you get that promotion? Well, I guess the admin at Unbiased America actually needed some unbiased opinions, so they asked me to come over and do most of the most of the grunt work while they hung out at the, at the Bush Estate in Kenny Bunkport, Maine. <laughs> yeah, that page has really gone downhill lately, so <laughs> we look forward to it going downhill even more. We've also got Maddie Palumbo here. Maddie is the author of Conscious of a Young Conservative and In Defense of Classical Liberalism, two books he wrote while in his teens. Is that true, Maddie? One of them in my teens, one of them when I was 20. It's pretty impressive. Uh, you're also the admin of Being Classically Liberal and the contributor to the National Review, Fee and Rare. And Maddie's coming to us tonight from a 28.8 kilobot modem. <laughs> so he will be dropping out regularly. <laughs> And we have a new face in the crowd here, who I'm sure most of you recognize, Austin Peterson. Austin, it says here you're the head honcho at the Libertarian Republic. Tell us about what you got going on over there with that stuff. All right. Well, Libertarian Republic, we've got 2 million readers a month. We're uh, expanding over leaps and bounds. I think a lot of this has to do with the election year. There's kind of an increased interest in libertarianism, I think. I, I'm basically taking market principles and applying market principles to libertarian ideas. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing is kind of like taking everything I learned when I used to work at Fox for the judge, so I used to produce Freedom Watch. So I, I learned a lot about marketing and, and creating uh, content there. So after that, uh, I started my own little small business, and the Libertarian Republic is sort of my um, capitalistic endeavor to spread the ideas, in a sense, uh, uh, using you know free market what means. Yeah, I worked in all these think tanks for years and years, and uh, you know nonprofits, and I learned a lot. But man, there's nothing like the free market to uh, to teach you a few lessons here and there. So here I am, three years later, still in business, spreading the ideas of economic freedom and personal liberty. Uh, and just trying to, uh, you know, get the message out as much as I can. That's awesome. It sounds like you're you're kind of liberal. Um, I met you down at CPAC. Is is that uh, is that you like to hang out at CPAC with the I conservatives like to and hang stuff? Hang out at CPAC. <laughs> I, I look like I do. I, maybe after two or three uh, glasses of whiskey. But uh, no, you know, I'm not a conservative. So I, you know, I kind of feel like a man wearing an ill-fitting suit sometimes uh, when I'm there. But uh, uh, no, I, I mean, I like uh, I like some conservatives sometimes when they say what I like. Otherwise, we should punish them. And uh, I say that, um, you know, conservatives, well, you know, at least they can, they know how to dress and they don't smell funny. So they're conserv the conference is the girls are hotter and, you know, it's more fun. But give me a libertarian. The girls are anyway. hotter. I didn't notice that. Well, they're hotter than the Democrats. But I disagree. I disagree about one thing. They smelled pretty bad down at CPAC. I don't know what it was. But it was Maybe pretty, some of those college students do. Right down <laughs> no, that was it was a good time. It was fun. So anyways, uh, let's see what everyone's drinking tonight. Maddie, what do you got? Yingling. I think same with Austin, actually. Oh, we got two Yingling. Nice. Oh, this is actually two. Three so I got, I'm holding the same as Austin right now. I'm now let's see what our lady friend Will is drinking. I got Will? so many beers oh, hanging nice. out right here. I'm ready. By the end of this show, I'm playing cool. to be shit faced. What do I have? <laughs> yeah, anything? I I can't. I'm not allowed to drink anymore. I'm on those antibiotics oh. from the crabs. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> trying to get rid of the clap. That's right. The STD. Anyways, I've got yep. Port Charlotte Scottish barley, heavily peated, and I will be shit faced by the end of this. What, dude? I specifically so let's did get on not, with the show. I specifically did not bring a whiskey because this was called Beer and Bastards, and bourbon was for bitches. What the fuck? God, there I, you I, go. Right, follow that to its logical name conclusion, is, huh? Kevin, you bitch, Kevin? Huh, Kevin? Huh? You some bitch? Huh? The name of the show is just 
a suggestion. Beer and bastards. Okay? Bastards so like forever. Beer. Bastards win. Down with the bitches. All right, I tell you what. I have a sidecar here, so there you go. If I need, I got my beer right Chaser. here. Chaser. Yep. All right, anyways, let's move on with the show. We're going to talk about uh, Rand Paul and so forth. Anyways, I want to tell everybody, the first portion of our show is brought to you tonight by Hearst's Hearses. Owner Heather Hurst has a fleet of custom-modified hearses to bring your loved ones to their final resting place at speeds of, in excess of 110 miles per hour. Don't linger. Give the devil the finger in a Hearst hearse. And let's move on. Will, what do you got to say for us? Oh, what was the question? I'm sorry. I'm working on some technical you're, stuff you're here so I can keep all about, three, three faces. About, you're going to talk to us about uh, Rand Paul, I guess. Oh, yeah, Rand Paul. I have some interesting questions about Rand Paul. I mean, insofar as it relates to the libertarian movement. I don't know Did you? I don't know if you guys, I don't know if Austin saw, he did an uh, interview with Brett Baer on Special Report. Did any of you guys catch that? I did. I didn't catch it, no. You did? Austin, did you see it? Yes. I mean, I thought it was a great, I thought he did a great job. I thought he nailed it. But I don't know. I mean, the first thing I considered was the libertarian movement and some of the uh, some of the answers he gave specifically on like same sex, you know, his views on same sex marriage. Mm -hmm. um, also, his views on foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know if you guys saw also four senators, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul. And I, I think it was uh, maybe Sessions wrote a, a letter to the Ayatollah. That was a big thing. I don't know how libertarians think about that. But Austin, what do you think about, insofar as it relates to the libertarian movement, what do you think about some of the answers he gave uh, related well, to those well, topics? Well, do you remember when Ron Paul was on Bruno and he called him a queer? Does everyone Ooh. remember that? When Ron Paul was in the movie Bruno and he called, yeah. uh, he called, and he called yeah. him a queer? You know, that's yeah. funny. It's funny, but uh, I don't remember people crucifying uh, uh, Ron when he called uh, homosexual is a queer, which we sort of see as a pejorative nowadays. I see a lot of people who are angry at Rand Paul over uh, his statements, but he's culturally conservative, just like a lot of my friends, like my parents, the people they don't like gay marriage. I don't, you know, I understand. I happen to disagree. I disagree with them vehemently. Uh, sometimes I think we, as the, you're, if you're asking in the context of the liberty movement, sometimes I think we have double standards, you know, that we hold up certain people to certain standards and we have double standards. Perfectly fine to question Rand about being culturally conservative. I'm not. I'm socially liberal. Hell yeah. But uh, and I love my gay friends and I love the idea of gay marriage, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but when it comes to Rand Paul's position on on gay marriage, you know, um, I see him. He's saying it's a state issue anyway, and he said multiple times that the government shouldn't even be in the business of it. Uh, it doesn't really sound like it's the kind of thing that gets me inflamed uh, about Rand Paul. It was, it was this foreign policy stuff that kind of blew my hair back. When I first saw it, but of course, you know, like Obama, I get my news from the news, so I, uh, I maybe right. I had. What to specifically? Think about it what specific? What specifically mm -hmm. about his foreign policy kind of, kind of, uh, you know, uh, caught your attention? Well, my, you know what? Mine, I had a knee-jerk reaction because I saw that he signed on with that neocon Tom Cotton's bill, and I was like, oh, I, what the hell? I, Tom Cotton, Tom, mother freaking neocon Cotton, who's bad mouth Rand. I was like, what the hell are you doing? And then I actually read what was going on and <laughs> educated myself. Uh, and, um, you know, the senators are the ones who are supposed to be uh, making, you know, treaties and doing this kind of stuff. I, I guess, like, there was a sort of uh, an outburst from the liberty movement about, you know, from the dovish wing of the movement that was um, like, oh, you know, like, Iran, God, this is heating up the rhetoric with Iran. Well, number one, fuck Iran. So, you know, yeah, absolutely, you should talk shit about them because they're a theocratic regime and very anti-libertarian. And two, uh, I think that the people don't understand the Logan Act, which all the liberal networks were like, Logan Act, Logan Act, Logan Act, hasn't been used since 1801. We have this thing in the, in the United States where if you don't enforce a law for a certain amount of time, it's not really uh, valid. So, of course, they're going to attack him on that. And uh, all the dovish libertarians are kind of like, eh, you know, because he signed with Tom Cotton, which I do. I agree. I hate that guy, but uh, screw neocons. Uh, but... Um, no, I mean, it really wasn't that big of a deal when I when I came down to it, because uh, all it does is assert the constitutional prerogative that senators already have. It's the Senate, Senate's job to be ratifying treaties and, and uh, making those kinds of negotiations. So, you know, okay. what do? What I agree do? with that. I, all the, all, the only thing the letter really did was tell the Ayatollah how our system works and that 
no deal with President Obama, even if he takes executive action, is going to last longer, basically, than two years. So, I mean, moreover, if Obama's going to make a deal with the Ayatollah, he'll have to go to Congress first. I mean, Absolutely. or he should go to Congress first. Um, uh, you know, I, I even heard a lot of conservatives and libertarians say, well, you know, they're undermining the president and so on and so forth, which I guess, you know, you have to look at it as the president really controls the tip of the spear, but Congress has some control of the back end, you know what I mean, of what mm -hmm. we do. Um, what do you think? What do you think, Kevin, um, you know, insofar as uh, uh, Rand Paul and his foreign policy stance, do you feel it is incompatible with uh, libertarianism in its purest form and also with, on well, the same sex issue? Well, the thing about Rand Paul presently is that he's looking for a White House run. You act differently, you say different things, you're not the same as you are when you're governing from D.C. as you are when you're running for, for the presidency. Now, he's in a weird position because his supporters are libertarian. And, um, I mean, his rabid supporters, for the most part, are libertarians as well as the youth. And if he's going to have to, if he's going to pick up uh, more voters, he's going to have to become more conservative, appeal to more conservatives. Now, he is conservative, don't get me wrong, but he's really going to have to tamp down on some of his, um, especially his foreign policy area, where he's been seen by some as, as too dovish, or even some people say, um, well, you talk about his father, Ron Paul, he's got a lot to, he's got a lot of baggage, Rand does. So when you see him signing on to a letter, like the letter he signed on to, you know he's doing so for political reasons. I don't know if it's going to help him or hurt him or not, but everything he does from this part, from this point forward is calculated to get votes. It's, and you're not going to get votes from libertarians. First of all, libertarians don't vote. Wait, yeah, no, for whatever exactly. reason. <laughs> he's not going to get votes from libertarians. Yeah, oh, no, reason. he might lose 0.5% of the vote. <laughs> exactly. What's the, I think he's, of, what's the point of... What's the point of moving away from libertarians? You're not going to lose anything in terms of political value to do so. He needs – he's a Republican now. He's not a libertarian. To that point, to that point Kevin, though, he has a hard line. He has a really hard line to walk here because conservatives won't vote either if he's too soft on, say, you know, national security issues. I mean, look at what they did with Mitt Romney when he ran. He Not just was he – he was he wasn't soft on national security issues. He was soft on – market principles and, and, and liberty principles, and a lot of conservatives, I know I didn't want to vote for him, didn't turn out. So at the same time, he's got to walk that fine line between conservatism and libertarianism and not alienate one either base. Do you, do you know what I mean? So uh, Yeah, and I think if he makes it, if he makes it to the, if he becomes a nominee, then suddenly things look up because he can attract, he can attract more of the center and more of even the left with, with some right. of the things that he espouses that don't normally appeal from like a, a normal Republican nominee. So I think he's got a big challenge getting through the, the primary season. That's his biggest problem is attracting the, the, the base voter for the Republican Party. And once and if he can do that, and I'm not saying he can, I think there's a lot of stumbling ground between between now and uh, next year. But if he can do that, then I think he's one of the stronger candidates to, to face off against okay. uh, I want to presumably move on Hillary Clinton. Here. I, want, I want to get the Maddie. I want to talk about the primary process and how libertarians can affect change within the Republican Party. I mean, clearly the GOP is feckless. Um, we need a new. I, I, we don't need a new Republican Party, but we need a revitalized Republican Party. Matt, do you have any opinions on how libertarians can pe can best affect change within uh, the GOP? Is it the primary process? What would you suggest? Um, honestly, I think libertarians already are changing kind of how the Republican Party is thinking, and I don't think it's necessarily policy. I just think that they have good ideas and they're spreading. Like there's a like, great video by Reason kind of polling gay marriage uh, uh, or opinions on gay marriage at CPAC, and most of the young Republicans seem to agree with it. And if, you know, if you, if you, even if you look at something like the war on drugs, it seems like younger Republicans are turning against it more and more. So, I mean, I think libertarian ideas are already taking hold, and I don't think, you know, I don't think policy is, is the reason why. I think they're just using ideas okay. and spreading. So, I guess okay. I to Austin, I don't know. Do you want me to repeat the question? I'd, I'd like to get your your stance on the same on that same question or your viewpoint. This is about infiltrating yeah, the Republican Party exactly. and uh, how they can affect change. 
This is only for the activist libertarians. I I, uh, I suppose that um, you know there comes a time when we, we 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 our children we start into the we start in politics. We sort of are naive, perhaps optimistic about what sort of changes we can introduce, and then we sort of get old and jaded, and now you get like me, and you kind of a grizzled old veteran. You know, the only way that we're going to to affect change is if we infiltrate the Republican Party at the, the caucus level, uh, try and win as many primaries as we can. Uh, focus heavily on the early states where Rand has an actual chance of winning, like Nevada and New Hampshire. Get boots on the ground out there, uh, coordinate with precincts, become precinct coordinators. Uh, we should be taking over the Republican Party this year. This year, not next year. This year is how you will win uh, the chance to get to go and be a Republican delegate next year. Uh, and expect a difficult fight. Uh, but the hard work of electioneering and campaigning is sometimes distasteful to libertarians. I think we tend to be a little romantic, and we see this sort of as a great epic battle between us and some evil force of others, neocons and Marxists and Democrats. When in reality, what, how you're going to affect change is the boring. The truth is usually boring. You have to go down to your local Republican club, and you got to beat up grandma to get the precinct yeah. committee spot. You know what I mean? Like you got to go take somebody's... You know, elected position down the street. You think you're going to come to Washington and fight in the belly of the beast? I, in reality, you have to go down but, to your local GOP club and you have to take right. over the That's party. That's a good with point. What did Kevin's the same question? What, what do you think? Well, you know, in terms of infiltrating the GOP, it's almost impossible to do anything if you don't infiltrate one of the two parties. Think about the challenge that faces. Well, first of all, the Libertarian Party, the actual capital L Libertarian Party, even Libertarians can't stand it. I mean, it's it's one of those things that people think, oh, if you say you're a Libertarian, does that mean you're part of the Libertarian Party? No, you're not. You're not a third party candidate. In fact, most Libertarians, like I said before, don't vote. For some, for some reason, they've decided, well, I'm talking more about the anarchist uh, segment of the Libertarian movement, but a lot of them just want to drop out and affect change in other ways. But if you really want to have a chance, what realistic chance do you have of affecting change when you have a government in place that's not going anywhere? It's got all sorts of you know ways of, of staying in power. What's your best chance of taking power? Probably from within, unfortunately, and a lot of people don't like to hear that answer, you're going to have to take over the Republican Party or the Democrats or one of the two parties. I mean, you're going to have to do something from within to, to, make, to make a change in America. Too many people don't see that as, as a possible route of change. I know we've, I see some of the people on the right here uh, talking about it, and it's very hard to get people to, to understand that politics is simply a means of change. Is it a good one? Is it, does it always going to work? No, it's not. But it actually is something that could possibly, you could actually wind up making a difference right. if you want to go through the Republican Party. Rand Paul and his father, Ron, also tried to go through the Republican Party. Did Ron make much change? No, but he certainly has a following, doesn't he? And he has a more of a mouthpiece that he goes through one of the two major parties than if he sat on the sidelines and did nothing and complained right. or went well, for a th third party candidacy. So I think eventually, and, and I think eventually it's going to head in the direction of libertarianism um, because the youth of today aren't socially conservative. And I right, think I that's, mean, and that that's leads me to my next design. question. And I'm going to direct this to Austin first, and then I'll go to Matt, and then I'll go to Kevin. I mean, we, we talk about how we infiltrate the party and so on and so forth, but we always forget that the establishment, this big government party, which the Republican Party really is. I mean, I don't. At, at times, I really don't think they want to change anything. They just want to run it. Um, they control the war chest. They control the money. And we saw this in the late 70s with Ronald Reagan. As certainly, the Bushes went after Reagan. Um, he had to defeat his own party before he, can get, he could even get the nomination. Um, do you think the GOP or the establishment, like Rents Priebus and so on and so forth, will support monetarily Rand Paul in the primary? I mean, he has a he has an uphill battle, uh, you know, uh, as it pertains to money. Hmm. What do you what, yeah. what, what are your course, thoughts on that, Austin? Yeah, well, you, I bet you the Koch brothers will probably be happy to bankroll that campaign. Well, There's a lot of rich libertarians. Don't the Koch brothers you bankroll you, Austin? Peter Thiel. There's a lot of uh, nobody bankrolls me, man. I sing for my supper every day. Every day. Uh, nobody gives me shit. I know. I know how that is. <laughs> Everything I get, I earn, man. And I don't yeah, get a well, goddamn Kevin bit of Matt, respect. Kevin and Matt are both bankrolled. <laughs> no, Kevin and Ryan Sam are. I mean, Ke money Kevin people. and Matt are both actually bankrolled uh, by the Cokes. So I just want to disclose that. I, but go ahead, Austin. 
Yeah. Are they really? <laughs> Fuck you guys. Okay, though, yeah. I get yeah. I get I so get... much shit for being a shill, and I don't get a goddamn dime of shill money. <laughs> I get ten, ten grand a day. That's it? Oh, I don't even want to tell you what Maddie gets. I don't even want to tell you what Matt gets, uh, so... but go ahead, Austin. <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> I'm, well, I'm not worried about Rand Paul raising enough money. I'm only worried about the obstacles that they'll put in his path. You know, the grassroots, Ron Paul, we raised $6 million in one day. If we get excited about Rand Paul and we take an opportunity to look at it, you know, we can grassroots fund this shit all the way through the Republican primaries. That's exciting. You know, this is paradigm changing. There's nothing that we can't do that we, we that we can do more than we've done already. OK, and that's before we even get the Coke money. You know, they weren't pouring right. millions into Ron Paul's primary campaigns. That was us, the activists. Rand, I think, will have that plus yeah, and some there's... establishment support. You know, a lot of people gave him crap. I'm for, sorry. Go ahead, Austin. I was going to say a lot of people gave him crap for uh, working with Mitch McConnell. Well, Mitch McConnell did him a lot of favors, you know. We had to beat the Republicans before you beat the Democrats. And then once you beat the Republicans, then they bow to you, you know what I mean? It's like with the Democrats. I mean, even if we won the general election, the, re the Democrats aren't going to have an armed revolution against the libertarian presidency of Rand Paul. They're going to acquiesce too. So, you know, a lot of times what happens is, is that we really do, I think, get into this uh, sort of black and white thinking of good versus evil you know, if we if we you beat a Republican, you know, here's a quote from Abraham Lincoln, and everybody can hate me for this. Do I not destroy my enemy when I make him my friend? Uh, and Rand Paul's made a lot of people who were his enemies his friends. And so I think that we sometimes we forget this that Republicans, if we win the Republican nomination, if Rand wins the Republican nomination, those Republicans will be our friends, just like what happened in right. uh, the Kentucky Senate race. You know, I wasn't there on the ground, but I was there intimately. All of the Republicans, once Rand won the nomination, they stood right, right behind him. And so they're going to, you know, we're going to have to kind of understand how this process works and be a little, probably even a little more forgiving. That's, that's why I go to CPAC. It's why I go to events like rallies. I go to Occupy Wall Street. You know, to talk to people, I try and talk to people who aren't of my ideological stripe. The only way that Rand is going to win is doing what he's doing, speaking to people outside of Stripe, working with people that, you know, that maybe we find a little bit disagreeable. He had a meeting with Al Sharpton that got him in trouble. He just signed right. on with Tom Cotton. Everything gets him, got in him in trouble. You need to look at the, you need to understand the nuance. Right. You have to understand the nuances of politics. You know, everybody's sort of inflamed and, you know, it's sort of like we have the uh, Tumblr sort of social justice movement here in the liberty movement that is, uh, you know, it's not like social democrat, social Marxism, but uh, sort of like offense culture. <gasps> How dare he talk to a neocon? You know, like the neocons might vote for us. I think they will. But it's like Reagan. You know, we've got to beat him first. Gotcha. And, and I think part of that is what you said before is we need to infiltrate, infiltrate not just the Republican Party at the grassroots level. We need to get some libertarian and conservatives in the and, and high up in the establishment of the party. I mean, I think these party leaders uh, and McConnell's one of them and certainly Boehner. I mean, they try to stamp out a lot of the uh, a lot of the libertarian and conservative principles. I, I hear them attack the Tea Party quite a bit. And to your point about grassroots, the Tea Party got ran, ran Paul into office in 2010, and that happened entirely at the grassroots level. So you're right there, Maddie. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think about um, yeah. uh, the establishment and how they react to say a, a libertarian or conservative candidate like Rand Paul? Um. I mean, I think even if the establishment, I don't know, let's say it reacts uh, not favorably, it doesn't mean they can't get a significant following. I mean, people like, you know, Ron and Rand Paul have developed a significant following on their own, and I think also mentioned the money that the Cokes are going to be spending. Um, I don't know, I think that money alone would have an enormous influence if they want to uh, support someone who's not part of the mainstream. So I don't think the support of the establishment necessarily matters. Um, I guess one example you could look recently is when Dan Bongino uh, ran in in Maryland. Uh, he had no establishment support, yet he lost in an area that was, I think, predominantly liberal by only about 2,000 votes. And I think there was a vote tally of like 110,000. So he, he did all this stuff independently, and he came very, very close to winning. So I don't think establishment support is necessarily okay. needed to win. And that. Kevin, what do you think? I mean, uh, taking Reagan as an example in the late 60s, and all the garbage he had to go through, uh, you know, with the establishment, most specifically the Bushes, who coincidentally are in this race again. I, I'm so sick of this family. It, I, I don't know if I'm more sick of the Bushes or the Clintons. But how do you, 
How do you feel like what are, what are the chances that the establishment backs up, say, this time early on a, a candidate like Rand Paul or perhaps a Ted Cruz? Zero. I think they're going to go for they'll go for they'll go for a Bush. Um, Walker has some momentum. You know, he could he could possibly be an alternative. He's you know not mainstream or he's not establishment. But I don't think the I think the last people they're going to support is somebody like um, a Ted Cruz, uh, maybe a Marco Rubio. I don't know. But I, it's all a matter of them getting through the primaries, really. Um, when you have people voting, when you have people voting down the center and, and center right, you're not going to get a lot of people voting across the country for somebody who's seen as a Tea Party or a Libertarian or whatever. So I think that I think the party wants to stay in power, and to do that, they believe that they still yeah. need to get the conservatives. And um, to get conservatives, you got it. You're going to be shy away from people who don't espouse traditional conservative values. And because of that, somebody like a Rand Paul, who is trying to tack to the right, he's trying to tack, he's trying to become more conservative or at least more traditional. But you know, I don't think he's got the traditional right. credibility to for people to support him. And somebody like certainly a Ted Cruz, who's a you know a flamethrower right. right now. Are they going to support somebody who who are they going to support no. somebody who doesn't come from the establishment? I don't think they are. I think it's going to take a big showing in New Hampshire. It's going to take somebody to come out of the woodwork, and if that happens, like right. Austin said earlier, I mean, they will support them. You th yeah, uh, the, the reason that separates Rand Paul, <laughs> specifically Rand Paul and Ted Cruz from the crowd, and, and, and Walker too, I mean, Walker flip-flops a little bit, is that these guys are a bit more principled. Um, that, you know, they're easy to pin down. They're not that, that tr your traditional like po political moving target. Um, I, I want to see what Rand Paul does in the Iowa caucuses if he, if he supports – ethanol uh, uh, subsidies, uh, that that interests me quite a bit. I want to see if he goes, says, I don't, you know, if he goes up there and he says, look, I don't support ethanol subsidies, I support the market to decide. You know, I, I know Ted Cruz did that at one time, but I would love to see Rand do something like that. You know what I mean? In the spotlight. I'd, I'd love to see that from, from, from a candidate. I'm sure libertarians would too. I, I just stand up for these principles at one time and take some of the flack. You, you know what I mean? And drops... People are dying. People are dying right, exactly. for a candidate who's going to come out there and be principled. And that's, I think, what I, I think that's that's what people want. And I think people see that in Walker. I don't. That's totally not true, by the way, because people don't really know him yet. He's a totally flip flopped on so many issues. But what they do know about him is that he took on, you know, he took a stand right, and he took on the, the unions, and that's pretty much point. all they know. But why right. are they Here's my him? point on that. Because because relative, I don't want to say it was easy to take on the unions. It never is. But that state was in such fis like uh, fiscal disorder that it was really, I mean, the, the voters were behind him there. It was like, look, and it, you could tell by the recall election. So it was, it was more so, it, that could be more so a political uh, uh, decision at the same time, a smart political decision, and, and, a, and, a princ and what looks like a principled one. Um, but Walker, when Cruz and I, I know specifically when Cruz wanted to sh wanted to shut down the government over Obamacare, he was totally oh, I'm against the shutdown, and I'm, a, you know what I mean, and that lacks principle. I mean, one of the constitutional checks on executive power and judicial power in that case was to was for uh, Congress. It was a legitimate check on power is to shut down the government and defund Obamacare. What do you, Austin? You have a your finger on the pulse of the libertarian movement. Do you think that? Libertarians in general crave somebody that's going to be principled and stand up to the establishment and stand up to these. Uh, okay. Totally. Absolutely. Swear to God. I mean, I, I, I used to get so excited watching Ron Paul just tear those status and new a-hole in the debates, you know, it's like, you know, and I didn't care that the Republicans were getting angry at us, you know, sitting around in those debates and stuff like that as I followed it and campaigned for, you know, my heart out. So yeah, I want to see somebody rip some some neocons, some new a holes. Like I want to see Lindsey Graham. I hate that guy. Spleen, you know, bleeding out guy. all over the auditorium. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like there, there is a time for war. You know what I mean? Like and and we must make war on our enemies in the time that we have in the next year, uh, if we want to win. You know, yeah, you got to win some hearts and minds, but don't, let's not give them an inch. You know, people like Peter King going out on oh, that on. Guy. Um, 
going out on Fox News and talking crap on Rand Paul. Now listen, Rand may have to come off as magnanimous and like friendly and sweet to the Republicans, but I sure as shit don't have to, and I'm independent. I can do whatever the hell I want. I can be an attack dog and a pit bull. And I suggest every freedom-loving, God-fearing, you know, <laughs> maybe not God-fearing, but uh, every freedom-loving person in this country do the same thing in your own way. You don't have to join me, or you don't even have to read the Libertarian Republic, although I wish you would, but... <clears throat> You know, get out there right. and, and bring the fight to these people. You know, like if you want to go join the Republican Party, do that. You know, do what you do best. Trade for the rest. I, <laughs> it's I, economic I, term. I uh, agree. You know, I mean, uh, you, you know, we need to get these people that are fired up and get them into the Republican Party and change the party from within, change this establishment, big government mindset. The re we really do. I, I, people always uh, go away from me for saying this, but we really do lack an opposition party in Washington. Meaning that it's a lot of it's just grandstanding and posturing, and they're really not willing to make the political sacrifices to change things. And it's really starting to piss me off. What doesn't piss me off is that Matt Palumbo still has sleepovers. Is that a fort that you made there? Is that? <laughs> yeah. I know, right? It, it looks, looks like, like made you guys have a little fort. flashlight. You're sharing head, a headphone, and, and you have a fort. Oh, sure. We're, we're just talking about stories <laughs> before yeah. we're on the air. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I brought my pillow pen and everything. Well, Connor, are you, you look a little terrified? <laughs> were, you, were you guys were, were you guys talking about the boogeyman again? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, well, I mean, there's that. And it's like we're in this cave somewhere oh. in Afghanistan. It's just like a, a that does white that is backdrop. that was UBL's yeah. life. That was UBL's life for the last <laughs> eight or eight or nine years of it. So you're right. I get it. Um, also, I uh, I went to show him Austin's page so you know who Austin is and. The second I did that, Austin's audio stopped working for me. So oh, I can't hear Austin God. anymore, unfortunately. Well, that's all right. You don't need. Uh, Sorry, I'm late. I you don't need to hear him anyway. I can kind of find it. But I wanted to um, uh, uh, move on. I want to get to obviously, if Rand Paul is going to run, I'm sure all of us here like Rand Paul to a certain degree. Um, it's the Democrat field that matters too, and there's a big shakeup in the Democratic field now. Um, certainly with all the stuff coming out about Hillary Clinton, which in my opinion, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, talk, talk about it, I my opinion, the Democrat Party yeah. had a lot to do with. I think they want a challenger from the left that has a chance, certainly at the money. What do you think, Matty? What are the, the, what are the uh, uh, prospects looking for a Democratic candidate? Do you think Hillary's going to take the field, or do you think she's going to have a challenge even from her left, which is really, really far left? Um, I don't, honestly, it's, it's too early to say so far. I think we probably really won't know who any of the serious candidates are for, you know, probably another six months to a year. Um, I don't see why not, why Hillary would not at least try to run. I know she seems to be kind of hinting at it. I don't see why else she would have published a book so close to an election season and kind of hyped it up as much as she did. So I think it's very possible. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, obviously. I think she has a lot of probably mainstream or moderate support. Okay, so are you guys sure avid R.L. Like Stein readers, or, or are you more like, I don't know, Babysitter's Club? <laughs> <laughs> what do we got there? I told, I can't. You want to uh, that one? <laughs> you <got it>. There <laughs> you go, there's some books. Start reading that, kids. Social, too, politically incorrect guide to socialism. I'm reading Richard Vigory's book, uh, Takeover, which is actually it's a very important book because this book influenced how the yeah, upcoming res, uh, Republican presidential debates are going to be handled. The upcoming Rep Republican presidential debates are going to be handled totally differently than they have uh, than they have in the past because the mainstream media, the liberal media, the left wingers and stuff have been controlling the debates, uh, and they they are the ones who decide like. You know what the questions are going to be and all that, and you have one like conservative network, Fox News, which holds debates. So if you read this book by Richard Vigory, Takeover, he talks about a new path for how the Republicans are going to pick their candidate this year. I think that's actually very interesting. I think it's uh, it's probably one of the most important books you can read from a political strategic very cool. uh, perspective this year. Uh, and so 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 yeah, so definitely check that out because it's all about how that's the media controls the narrative. More. Um, I wanted you to get you that same question I asked Maddie about the Democratic field. How do you feel? Do you think, I mean, in my opinion, the whole thing, this whole email thing, the, 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 uh, the donation she's getting, certainly from, I mean, here she's out to espouse women, women's rights if you criticize Hillary or a sexist. Meanwhile, she's getting donations from places like Saudi Arabia, 
Oman and Algeria, which are probably among the most, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, don't respect women's rights at probably the highest degree. Um, I, I think this is coming within the Democrat a Party, certainly from the left. What do you think, Austin? Do you think this is an attack at Hillary to, to give to to have somebody come up on her left flank? Would you, uh, you? I don't have the name of the person Elizabeth that you Warren. think is going to be yeah, her challenger. Sir, you talking about definitely Elizabeth Warren, Elizabeth Warren or someone from the left? Yeah. That's who you're talking about? She, <laughs> doesn't, she doesn't have a chance in hell. I mean, like, she's so she, she's more socialist than socialists. You know what I mean? Like, she's right. like she's, she's almost though. like Rand Paul in the sense that like she's kind of an outsider, you know. But she's not. She's so establishment. It's not even funny. I mean, she's the one who supported keeping the export import bank. She says she's for the common people. Yet when she got oh, in office, she you know yada yada yada. No There's doubt so she's a like total phony. Shit There's no doing. doubt about it. So, she's a so phony. Elizabeth, but at this, she, oh, she's a she total brings that same phony. message though as yeah, Obama. So I, she brings know, that same that, populist demagogic yeah, message yeah, but, as but, Obama, but, and she'll she'll nail. She'll get those people out to the polls. Go ahead. You know what, you guys. You know what you guys are going to have to come to terms with, and this is going to be the real challenge, is the, is the reality that a lot of Republicans openly state that they would rather vote for Hillary Clinton I'm sure. than Rand Paul. I'm told. That's the real I'm problem sure. we've got to face. What are you going to worry? Don't be worried. It's not, you know why? Because Hillary Clinton's, uh, she's not some <laughs> radical left winger. Hillary Clinton is actually middle of the road, very centrist. You know, she's even more she's more reasonable than Barack Obama. <laughs> I'm saying this objectively. You know, I, I don't like Hillary Clinton, but the truth is, is that there, there's a big club, there's a little club, and you ain't in it. And uh, you know, the establishment Republicans, the Wall Street Republicans, the big government statist neoconservative Republicans. They no, and, will support Hillary Clinton if it comes down. If we beat them, right. they'll go to the Republic and, Democratic and Party. And Austin, you're going back to my Hillary point Hillary about Warren. there's no real opposition party. A lot of the establishment of both parties are relatively the same. I think it's just a matter of degree of matter of degree of statism within both parties. But both are big government parties. There's little doubt about that. I mean, whatever. Would, let's say Rand Paul gets in there and he wants yeah. to shrink uh, the federal government. I mean, this harms the power of every single politician. And I don't think I don't care what party they are. I think they want more power, not less. So I would agree with you in that. Oh, yeah. Well, just remember when Rand Paul gets into the presidency, you know, he'll like he's not a dictator. Right. You know, he's not uh, he can't change laws on his own. He's the president. He has a certain enumerated powers. So don't get your hopes up, you know, right, that he's exactly. going to rewrite our drug laws. You know, he may refuse so, to enforce certain things here and there, but he's he's bound by law to enforce the laws that's right. of the Constitution. And here's of the my United point. States. Now, and I'm going to ask Kevin this question. Just with Austin, working off of Austin's point, it's kind of unfair. I mean, Rand Paul's kind of at a disadvantage, certainly as the president. He, he'll restrain himself to the document he he, with, he he upholds an oath to, whereas Obama doesn't really care. He'll he doesn't care about the Constitution. He doesn't care about how our polity operates. We're at a disadvantage. Um, do you think there's any? Let's say, let's look at, Ooh, let's, look at <laughs> let's look at, let's look at, let's say Rand Paul is in office hypothetically. What what could he do to change things? Uh, you know, to Austin's point, he's not going to circumvent Congress. Go ahead, Ryan. Got uh, Kevin. Nothing. No, he's not going to do anything to change things. The, the reason is that. Um, well, first of all, just to go back, Obama came in saying he was going to do all these things and it didn't work out that well for him. Most of the change he's affected has been through executive actions, which may or may not even be constitutional. Um, and he's what, in his sixth or seventh year of presidency? He, I mean, besides Obamacare, which you know may or may not actually be constitutional in and of itself, what has he done that's made his followers happy? People want to attack left from him. People think he hasn't done enough. They they want uh, Elizabeth Warren. I mean, could you go any further left than Elizabeth Warren? Who's next? Sanders? I mean, seriously, at what point do you stop saying, okay, my president couldn't do enough, therefore I'm going to vote for someone further to the left or further to the right or whatever. At, at a certain point, you have to realize they can't do anything, all right? The, the system, the way it's set up, first of all, the way it was supposed to be set up is that there's checks and balances. That's supposed to stop you from being from going crazy. But the way it's really set up now is the establishment, the people in charge, the people with the money, the people who are in, in the in the top of the it doesn't matter if they're on the 
conservative or at their uh yep can i ask a question yeah are we are we going oh yeah to, are we going to I mean, take we're going to do that right after this at some point yes we are yeah no I, I feel bad for them because they're they're yelling at us okay. over there and then they've got a lot of good questions so I we want, got I want... we, we were going to do the last yeah. 20 minutes is all okay. going to be user questions okay. so. all right good yeah saying... no just to say just to complete my train of thought here I don't think that any president is going to be able to change, affect any change. And I, I definitely don't think that even a Rand Paul is going to be able to come in here. People, the people who support libertarians, they want the whole system torn down. They don't want a tiny change here and a tiny change there. And if Rand Paul somehow gets elected, do you think he's going to tear down the system? Do you think he's going to be able to? He, he's got to fight the Constitution, number one. And like you said, I don't think he, I think he's principled enough not to go to, to be to do something against the Constitution and number two he's got to fight the establishment those two things are going to keep him in check and it's going to if he gets elected it's going to leave a whole lot of uh, I, I agree with of, you. of angry supporters here and, comes Deb and Downer. to that point I, I mean what Republicans <laughs> can do now that doesn't offend the Constitution wah, like doing wah. things like getting rid of the filibuster rule in the Senate to get some of these to get some of these bills passed and certainly to defund parts of the DHS to defund Obamacare and get rid of a lot of these big government bills. Um, I don't know if they have the guts to do it. I certainly would, but uh, at, and at no way does that offend the Constitution. So they're really not even using what the Constitution gives them at this point. So I see Rand Paul as I see Rand Paul as somebody who could lead them into doing something like that, and I hope he will be. But um, I want to move on to some viewer questions, and I want Austin to. Can you see that Austin? That question up there. The one just above the screen. Which one? Oh, I saw the Libertarian Party. No, no, it's Iran, above Rand the Paul. Can you guys see that too? The Libertarian Party. Oh. Yeah. What? I consider my. Oh, yeah. I, I see, see it, it. I see it. I consider myself I can see a it. socially liberal but fiscally conservative person. What's the difference between myself and a libertarian? Okay. Well, I'm socially liberal and I'm fiscally conservative. Well, I don't even like to say fiscally conservative. I'm fiscally libertarian because there's no such thing as a fiscal conservative, okay? Conservatives aren't fiscally conservative. I'm fiscally libertarian, meaning that I believe in Austrian economics, free markets, uh, as limited government as you can get before it's so small that you can finally drown it in the bathtub. And I believe in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Like, I believe in living your life to the best. I'm a bit of a hedonist. So I'm socially liberal, you know? Yeah, you know, like women and alcohol and, like, rap music and like living your life on the edge hell yes all of those things so you can be a libertarian and be socially liberal it just means that i don't want to force my liberalism on anybody else i'm socially liberal i get a little sexy sometimes but i'm not going to force that on anybody else and if you believe in jesus and purity and 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 light and all that stuff that's fine you know i'm i'm the type of guy that i'm going to be a little bit of a badass a little bit of a rebel but you can totally be libertarian and be socially liberal you can also be socially conservative and libertarian the point is, is that as long as you don't want to force your belief on anybody else, you can be a libertarian. So you are a libertarian, Maddie, John. what about you? What do you think? I mean, clearly, you're oh, but the question, right? Clear, so well, I actually couldn't yeah, just answer the question. But clearly, you're socially liberal because you're spooning. You and Connor are spooning there in your in your house fort. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that that may not affect your answer, however. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, the uh, short answer is um, nothing, and the long one is nothing. Wait, what did you? That's so, all you got. All right, got. I'm gonna move this along. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, nothing. I I try to keep it concise. <laughs> if you could tell. Yeah, you're busy over there. I'm playing with the flashlight or something. Yeah. Um, Kevin. <laughs> the man, he's written. He's already written two <laughs> books. He's 13 years old. Leave him alone. He's got <laughs> nothing to say. I'll probably you could have not do more book out to feed into that stereotype. Just leave him alone. I am working on it. I am working on it. Um, okay. Kevin, um, my God, I lost my train of thought now. I just keep thinking. I'm thinking about Little Spoon, Big Spoon with Maddie over here. Um, oh, Matt, <laughs> Kevin, do you have an opinion on the on the question? <laughs> no, what's the I question again? My, no, because the all question I heard up top on, above the screen, the viewer question. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, there's no difference. I mean. That's the actually I, I spoke about this at CPAC. That's the definition. If you told people in America, mainstream people, um, if you said a libertarian is fiscally conservative and socially liberal, a lot there'd be a lot of people coming out as libertarians. 
I, I think there's a lot of people who don't right. quite understand what a libertarian is. And, um, you know, obviously that's a very general description. It's a lot more, it's a lot uh, different than the general description. But the reason why you, you actually tell that, people, the reason why you can't say that though, Kevin, is because right now we're caucusing with conservatives. We're trying to take over the Republican Party. So we have to be careful and not, not brand it socially liberal, fiscally conservative, even though, you know, a lot of us are. Uh, and, but the thing is, is that uh, once we beat these Republicans, we should take over the Democrats too. That's what the progressives did. They took over both parties, remember? So, you know, we got to beat the Republicans right. and then we're going to beat the Democrats. So socially liberal, fiscally conservative might be a viable strategy five years from now, eight years from now, ten right. years from now. And, and so, my point know, on that question is, and I, what I would consider Rand Paul to be, and I, I agree with Rand Paul on a lot of issues, is I'm not so much concerned with the social issues. I am concerned with them, but what I'm really more concerned with is how we decide these things. And, I mean, we have a rule of law that I think people generally don't necessarily want to follow. You have that, that you know, uh, the dichotomy between self-government and individual rights. And I mean, you have people here, you hear health care is a right, food's a right, school educations, everything's a right. And, you know, we don't let people decide these things the way our constitutional structure usually commands. Um, I don't think Rand, if Rand Paul, if, that, if same sex marriage offends Rand Paul, he really he's really kind of like impotent at the federal level to do anything about it, say, in Minnesota that voted to to uh, recognize gay marriages. And he respects that rule of law and as much as he won't circumvent the Congress ever. Do, do you know what I mean? So I'm more about, well, I have my views in my state and, and, and closest to me, and I don't want to change the views. I don't really care what those people in New York do. I just want to make sure that these things are decided properly under our constitutional system, our Republican system. So, And I think Rand Paul would agree with that. Um, I don't know if that's you know, too stupid or something. I don't know. I don't know what Maddie's doing right now, but I can't. I don't know where his hands are. Oh, no, there's one. Um, I'm going to get another question. <laughs> Maddie, keep your hands keep your hands uh, in view. There you go. See, his well, buddy well, is the one who does it. Right. Does all the work for him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was I was not paying right, attention. What are we, we, we going to talk question, about? Yeah. Like <laughs> sex. Here's here's one. Drugs. What political? No. Go ahead. Go ahead. Austin. Right, what political you. changes? Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, what political changes have you managed to create so far that have had a significant impact on your lifestyle? What important things will you be able to do in a libertarian society that will affect your lifestyle in a significant way? <laughs> Both very different questions. The political changes I've managed to create that have had a significant impact. So it's I'm the subject here, the impact on my lifestyle. Um, mine was when I was in New York City and I was trying to spread uh, the the idea of ideas of liberty through Ron Paul's presidential campaign. I was just a um, volunteer. So you know, just volunteering on the street for Ron Paul, those that had an incredible impact on my life. So uh, it's amazing how like little tiny things that you do can have enormous impacts in your life. Uh, all the people that I met, you know, the money we raised, the excitement and everything. The second question, what important things will you uh, that I could do in a libertarian society that will affect my lifestyle? I don't know, two <laughs> chicks at one time. Yeah. <laughs> No, I guess I could do that now, but uh, but what would affect my lifestyle in a significant way? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I guess uh, I, I, you know what? I could hire more people because of the taxes. You know, I wouldn't be paying you know an ass load of taxes every year. I could have more employees. I could hire more people at the Libertarian Republic. I could expand um, operations. I could, you know, create jobs. I could do a lot more things if the government wasn't so big. Uh, and a lot of those things would be good for the community. So if you, if I lived in a libertarian society, there's almost no end to what I could do, including <laughs> teachers at one time. All right. Um, Kevin, do you want to answer that same question? You're a big-time libertarian. I mean, we're talking Rothbard. Oh. No, I don't. I've done nothing. I hate politics. I, I my, my <laughs> What I've tried to do with politics is to, to point out to people that I think that you know you got to take baby steps no matter what you do. And I try to tell people, be them anarchists or Republicans or whatever, that whatever your goal is, you're probably probably not going to reach that goal. You're going to have to do it a, a very small, tentative steps at, at one time. And uh, as much as I respect somebody who's going to go out full bore and going to enter the political process, I think most of them are going to get uh, just be disappointed, and most of them are not going to um, end up getting the change that they they desire. But it doesn't mean don't try. And, you know, I tell people this all the time. 
you only have one life, you know, live it how you want to live it, but also don't try to, you know, try to make it better. So I've, my goal when I started on Biased America was just, you know, let people know what I'm thinking about certain issues. And maybe if people agree with me, then they'll actually um, come to the same conclusions as me. Doesn't mean I think I'm going to get everything I want out of life. But, you know, some people do look at Hillary and, and, you know, look at certain people, look at the Bush clan. I mean, there's the one in the million shot where they ended up uh, uh, controlling America Kevin, for, for, for I, decades. I just want to kill myself when I listen to you talk, Kevin. I don't know why, but slowly <laughs> I want to just inject mercury into my veins. I, I wish there was That's my goal. so much my, That is my goal. I wish there was so much fluoride in my water that it would really poison me. Or that I would get a vaccine that would give me AIDS. That's what I always think. At once. Why? Yeah, Are you he's so negative? very negative I'm guy. You make me want to kill myself. I'm not negative. I'm realistic. No. I'm realistic. Listen, you, you have can to be realistic, no, you, but you've got to be. You've got to have, you have some to optimism. separate what I believe is going, what I believe is possible, from what I want to be possible. Like I trust me. If you ask me who I want to be president, out of the people who have the best shot, it's Rand Paul. Now, does that mean I'm a I'm a Ron bot, Rand bot, whatever you want to call these the, his followers? No, it doesn't. But it doesn't mean that I think he's got a chance. I don't think he's going to make it through the primaries. And I'm just being realistic. Not with that attitude, yeah. they won't. Don't listen to this asshole. Fight the fight, man, fight, Kevin. Fight, fight, fight the fight, man. Fight. Shut up. God. You... Yeah, fight the what man. Not, do, what's, do not what go quietly into that good night. Do not go yep. silently into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. See, Kevin, you're wrong. Anyway, let's go back to. Is that Independence uh, Day or Shakespeare? Let's go to Maddie. I want Maddie to answer this one. I think I think you put you had you had a lot of this in your like some of the rebuttals to the stuff in your book. Yeah, well, that's uh, his boyfriend. I mean, his boyfriend. Um, can you hear me, Maddie? Maddie's frozen. Look, I think he's frozen. I'm not frozen at all. Can you, all, can you see the uh, the question? Can you, you see the question? You can't hear me. Yeah, Are you're unfrozen. Can you hear me? No, it's fucked. All right. All right. Anyway, Austin, can you see the question? And you could probably hear me too, which is a, it's pretty, which is probably pretty good. No. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, I know. Hopefully, it looks no, like it's unfortunately, just me and you I, I can hear you. Um, um, I want you to start with that. This is, <laughs> I, the, this is I'm worst the, case scenario. Uh, you're the last person I want to be stuck with anywhere at absolutely any time. Yeah. So. I told you I was going to fake <laughs> but a seizure. You want to start with that? I know you've handled this at UA a couple of times. So you want to answer that question? Kevin? Kevin, I hate you. Kevin, I hope you I hope you drank so much and you... <laughs> How would you prevent the spread of racism and sexism yeah, without yeah. laws made yes, by states? Yes. Is that the question you're talking about? How would you prevent the spread of racism and sexism without laws made by the states? Well, is it really laws made by the states or laws made by anybody that's preventing something from happening? Why? I mean, isn't it the market that... Why do you feel the need to prevent racism and sexism? I mean, like... Is it like, is it really that bad, racism and sexism in the United States? Is it really that bad? Is it preventing you from getting you to work in the morning? You know, like, are you not able to get a job because of racism and sexism? Like, for God's sake. Well, I think, I, actually, I think you make, no, I think, no, the, I think, the, ahead, the, I think the better point is, I think the better point is, is racism and sexism subsiding in America because of laws? Or is it just subsiding in America because the culture has shifted? I mean, is it real? Do we really want to credit government? Do we want to credit laws for the shifts that have have occurred? Uh, basically, culturally, people have have shifted to a less uh, racist culture, and the more people die out, the more you can actually see. And on a graph, you can see the best way to measure racism that I've come across is you ask the people, do they favor um, multi? Do they favor biracial marriages? Or if you, you look at that question wanna... since the 1950s, it's been going straight down. Right. And do you think that's because of government laws? No, I, I, I agree with you, Kevin. And, and to that point, people always. If you want to fight, oh, okay. if you want to fight, uh, people yeah, always ahead, never, sorry, ahead, never really factor in the, 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 I don't know, the influence of the state, certainly on racism. 
Um, certainly the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case by declaring a human being property and Plessy versus Ferguson, which gave us however many years of Jim Crow laws in the South, separate but equal and so on and so forth. People don't understand that a lot of the racism was embedded in jurisprudence and law. So, I mean, that's what that's what perpetuated it rather than, I think, stopped it. And to Kevin's point, a lot of these uh, the market will handle these things. Oh, no, 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 say, no. Uh, You're a racist real estate agent and you don't want to show property to Asians. You're going to you're going to suffer in the market by doing that. You know what I mean? So I think the market can handle it far better than any laws. What do you think, Austin? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there, you know, it shows that. What was the perfect example last week? The the university, the kids were singing a racist right. song and they got run out of town. You know, like that's that's culture right there, taking care of things. You know, no government necessary. The only government that was necessary was the government to protect the guys from getting assaulted as they were moving out of their frat house. So, um, no, I don't think racism is a big problem in the, in the United States, and I don't think sexism is a big problem in the United States. Uh, these are not the main issues that we really have to fight, and I don't give a damn what people have to say. But, oh, you're a white male. Your opinion doesn't matter. But you know, I really don't. I just can only feel so bad for uh, for social justice warriors when I live in the first world, and their biggest problem is is that please fight the sexism of women right. having to wrap presents at Christmas that they might be expected to wrap presents right. at Christmas. This is a real gripe uh, from social justice warriors, uh, or that, and it also it to me. I see racism like in things like the drug war, uh, but the the uh, the social justice war community has no interest in reducing the criminal justice code or in legalizing drugs. And so I see none of that kind of rhetoric right. from our social democrat friends of the legalization of drugs or anything like that. Very minimal, very minimal. No, no, no. The government has a job in regulating drugs. They say. Remember, these are the people who created the FDA. You know, libertarians are distinct, and we like sometimes caucus with liberals and stuff like that because maybe of our social liberal lifestyle. Don't, don't get me wrong; they want to red, they want to register gay marriages with the state. They want to register quotas of how many African Americans and Latinos and certain numbers were hired, just like they do with government jobs. They want to see that with private sector jobs. Don't kid yourselves. So, yeah, you know, if you're going to want to talk about racism in the United States, it's the racism you can't talk about. Or it's the issues that that uh, that have been put on the um, the back burner. I mean, look at gay marriage. You know, what is one of the biggest cultural groups that's against gay marriage? Or who? It's the African-American community. Why? Because they're overwhelmingly religious. Religious people tend to not like gay marriage. So, you know, you're going to attack them for that? Or would it be racist to say, hey, African-American and religious community, of which there's a great many of you, please stop opposing gay marriage because you're homophobic. You know, you can't talk about that. No, instead, we have to watch our television shows about how we as the devil, we're all the devil, the white males is the devil. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's bullshit. Uh, racism, here's the thing. This will piss off the racists. There's only one race, okay? The human race. We're all members of the human race. And there really isn't that much different between us. But the cultural the cultural Marxists, you know, they're like, no, no, separate. We're different. We're, you know, no, no, we need to keep it apart. No, they're the ones who want to keep us separate. You know, they're the ones who want to make a distinction between the black community and the Asian community. How dare you make an Asian face? How dare you sing nigga when you're singing a rap song? You can't say that because they want to cordon us off and control us. It's a form of control, not necessarily governmental control. It's that political correctness control. And it's 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 very, very uh, fascist. So we, I think we have to resist that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, the Hillary Clinton presidency, it's going to be really interesting because all of a sudden millions of racists under Obama's presidency will all become sexists. So, you know, we need to fight that kind of rhetoric and we need to understand the Hegelian dialectic, the Marxist dialectic, how they control our speech, how they control the dialogue so that we can fight back. I think right now we've got a big problem because most of us are ignorant to it because we're all like, hey, racist, and libertarians are playing social justice warriors. That's because right. they've been I caught agree. up in the um, dialectic. Moving on, the next question. I don't know what, what he's Peter Jefferson's talking about here at all, but you can either dispel this, whatever this rumor is, or confirm it. I don't know. Do you see the question, Austin? <laughs> Why do I, what is this? Okay, I'll get Austin come on rumors he's spreading about a problem. Okay, how often do you beat your wife? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I never heard, how often do you beat your wife, Peter Jefferson? Do you beat, how often do you beat her? You know what I mean? This is one of those questions, like, can you comment on a, I don't, like, I what is the question? I don't know what, what that means. Where is he now? Why is it? 
why is it all my why are all my haters such pussies you know i listen i see a lot of my haters in real life and ain't none of them got the balls to come to my face and say how they feel about me you know what somebody wrote a hit piece on me let me tell you something rich man, you pussies you fucking pussies you pacifist pieces of shit let me let me tell you something. Let me get in your little stump, dumbass faces. If you think you got balls, nut up and come and look at me right in the face. And all 220 pounds, six foot tall of Why me, do they hate you? And tell me how you feel about me. Why are they hate you? Some guy wrote a, a hit piece it. on me. Uh, you know why? Because uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons. You either hate me or you love me. But I'm okay with that because at least I'm relevant. The point is, is that somebody wrote a hit piece on me last month. And I saw him at CPAC, and he didn't even have the nerve to come and say, hey, Austin, how are you feeling? Like, what do you think about this? He didn't understand my position. We were talking about the Pope, and I was bashing the Pope because I'm not Catholic. Um, so I went and got in his face, and I said, hey, 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 fuck you. And I, right in front of his friends, and I said, what, you didn't even have the balls to come and talk to me and ask me for a You're a journalist. Why wouldn't you ask me about how, you, how I feel about this position? Um, so, you know, who is this guy, Peter... Jefferson, who asked me a question, it doesn't have the. I don't look at his picture. Is. Look at his picture. Yeah, look at him. Good God, Jefferson. You know, like this isn't some. Je the, take off your name. You have no guts. Uh, and neither did Jefferson actually, because during the American Revolution, he was running like hell uh, away from the British positions. You know, not like Washington, who out, went out front. Yeah, you need people, libertarians like me. You need me on that wall. You need me on that wall to fight for you. You pussies. God, I'm so sick of this shit. Yeah, let's go to the next question. I love that relevant. diatribe, though. That was very good. Thank you. Um, I want I, I want to I want to <laughs> get Kevin. Uh, I want to get Kevin on this one and then I'll go to Austin because this is what we were kind of talking about earlier. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait no, hold on. Hold on. When we get there, he says uh, it's Jeff Peterson. That's <laughs> another one of my little pussy haters. Another guy, little <laughs> asshole guy, little beta male, tiny penis man who comes after me. That's you think who so? That Jefferson guy is. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know who that is. Oh, Yellow I know who he is. He's been trying to fuck with me for years, man. Always, always hating, man. He's just like hating on my flow. You know, hate That's a pretty hate, good though, You Jeff figured Peterson. that out. That's pretty good. I didn't even think of that. That was. <laughs> that's pretty good. Well, it's Josie, Josie Wales, the beautiful, yeah, the inimitable. That's pretty good. I'm good for you. I wouldn't. I don't. I don't know how people do this. They make up a fake account just to like, just to make shit up. That's weird to me. But anyway. Um, and then he likes, he like sends me messages. He sends me messages like, oh, I don't think you're the enemy anymore. Now I think people like Kathy Reisenwitz are the enemy and stuff like that. After he fucked with me for so many years. And then he adds me a, sends me a friend request. <laughs> I fuck off with that shit. All right. All right. No all right. more. This, I want to go to this stuff. question. This I, I hope you all can see it up at the top. And this is kind of goes back to what we were talking about. It's a good question. Um, and I want Kevin to handle this first. Um, how can we affect change? "Quote unquote" from the inside, without holding some kind of permanent supermajority of Congress, is that not unrealistic? Should we be looking for other ways? Go ahead, Kevin. Well, that's the, that's always the question that comes up. How do you actually change the system without the system completely collapsing? Ask an anarchist how they want to Abolish. change the system. You're probably going to get them saying, "Well, I'm just going to do my own thing," and yeah, it's going to be a whole lot of nothing. And now I, I, I have a great respect for a lot of anarchist principles. Don't get me wrong. The question is, how are they going to make it happen? From the inside, it's not probably going to happen except with baby steps. But that's probably the only steps you're going to be able to right. actually make happen from the inside. Any other way you want to make it happen? Is there a realistic way that America is going to collapse? And if it does collapse, are we going to collapse into anarchy? Or are we going to become like a, a, a bigger, a more status regime? I mean, oh, these questions come up a lot, and they, they, there's no real answer to it. And somebody who tries to say that they can affect change from the outside, ask them, how? How are you going to affect change without going through the political process? What change are you going to affect? And don't tell me just by ignoring the government, because you ignore the government. They come to the door, your door, with a gun, right. and they tell you pay the tax, and they throw you in jail. Tell me how you're actually going to change the system from the outside. And I have yet to hear a good a good answer to that. Okay. All right, I got you. Um, Austin, what's your view on the above question? How do you, I, I mean, Eric's asking, how do you change it, quote unquote, from the inside without holding some kind of permanent supermajority of Congress? Do we need to have a supermajority? Right. Doesn't take it doesn't take a majority to succeed, Eric. 
but a keen, irate minority. No, an irate minority keen on setting the brush fires in men's minds. Remember your Samuel Adams. Remember your founding fathers. God damn it, fight. You don't have to have a majority of people to win, but just enough people who are dedicated and who want to change things. That's how a caucus works. If you arrive at a caucus, most people are going to be voting for some majority candidate, right? You've got to go in there and win hearts and minds. You've got to fight. You've got to get in there and Taco salad's mad. The people say I'm ranting. Are you not enjoying my rants? Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? No, you don't need a majority to succeed. I believe that all you really need is a... <laughs> is I don't know if I'm sorry. No, that I makes... I agree. Minority. It's and all good. It's I, all I, good. I, when he says from um, the inside to my... It, I, I, we, Austin and I were talking about it earlier, was grassroots, meaning we need to permeate the inside. Uh, the body politic needs to permeate the parties. I don't see a lot of that happening right now. I think there's a disconnect between say, the establishment of both the Democrat and Republican parties and the people. And I think they're enacting laws and doing things contrary to the ideas of our country. And I think we need to permeate them. I don't think the supermajority of Republicans is going to solve anything. I don't think a supermajority of Democrats is going to solve anything. I don't care if they control all three aspects. They control the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. That won't change anything. We change it. We're the inside. I don't know. And, and, and Austin brought a lot of that stuff up. It's not about majorities. It's about an irate minority, us respecting liberty and rights, and, and, and we change it. We just have to get government to listen to us. You know what's not, this is going to sound really crazy, but you guys really need to study the history of the Russian Revolution. Uh, how, the, how Lenin and how the, um, the sailors of Kronstadt which I like to call them the heroes of Kronstadt. Many of those uh, of the ones who, before they were Soviet, uh, before the Soviet became the Soviet, the Red Army was taken over. There were some heroes, democratic heroes, who wanted to overthrow the Tsar. And the way that they did that through mass democracy, yes, there was a violent overthrow in many ways, but there were... There were elements of the Russian Revolution that libertarians can learn a lot from today. Uh, people like Saul Alinsky is a progressive, you know, antithetical to libertarian values guy, but he has good tactics. Um, so don't adopt the principles, but we need to adopt some of the tactics of our enemies in order to win. George Washington used the Fabian strategy. Some people might be familiar with Fabian socialists and how they win power uh, for socialism, how they, they create bigger government by using a uh, sort of incremental approach. Uh, George Washington used that to beat back the British armies. Mm, uh, a keen understanding of history and understanding of our enemy's tactics. Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, said, Know your enemy and know yourself, and in a thousand battles you will never lose. So we need to study our opponents and stop reading so much you know, Hayek and, and Friedman, because we've got the basics down. We need to go make war on our enemies mm -hmm. and understand our enemies. Okay, very cool. I don't know if we want to – let me see. Oh, did I hit the wrong thing? No, that was the wrong question. But do you want to make fun of uh, Peter Jefferson some more, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> is he here? Did he ever – did we ever find out what this whole like, – I don't know. Let's solve, I don't even know what was. this means. Something about looking at a dog? Well, I'm confused. So i got to get gay. rid of that thing. so gay. What solid proof do you have of a person as much as look at a dog in the wrong way? I don't know I, what I don't, that looks means. looks like Jeff Peterson to me. It's kind of trippy, really. Only he could. Hey, Joe Baraski's on. I heard could. there was a... I, I heard there was a rumor that... All right. No. I'm not even sure this is something I should say. I heard there was a rumor that Jeff Peterson and I don't know. dogs... Really? Come on. Sexual, I, that's I'm not... Gonna, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah, shit is too much for me. I, I did. Why... I'm too dignified to answer this. That's what he's talking about. So I heard about, oh, yes, wow. that's the rumor spreading yes, on ahead. the interwebs. Hey, Will, you mind if I interject for a second? Yeah, I, I would love to say I am, but I okay. have to get cheese steak. You're going to get, so you're going to Gino's. You're going to, all right. Cheesesteak. We're going to answer this question. Yeah. All right. All right, Maddie. If that's what you're calling it now. If that's what the kids are calling it, cheesesteaks now, I'm just going to, I'm going to go along with it. Have fun with your cheesesteak there, Connor. <laughs> Cheesing? <laughs> yeah, I know. I get it. We totally. Shoot me some picture messages. Man. I'll see you guys later. Um, <laughs> does libert Austin, does, libert for you, see ya. does libertarianism <laughs> encourage the end of state interventions in the social field? For example, the end of social workers' jobs, ethnic community recognition, etc.? <laughs> Uh, I would say so, certainly. I mean, I would love to see social workers and, you know, ethnic community recognition, whatever that is, be gone. Absolutely. Um, 
yeah, I don't give a damn. Like the the government should have no say in any of our social lives. It should have nothing to do with our social lives. The government, if it is to exist, is so to uh, to uh, defend our liberties and uh, our liberties from foreign threats and from domestic threats. That's why they take that oath to the Constitution. I'm the only one left. You, oh, it's just you and me oh, now, no, Kevin. I'm, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Okay, he's there. You're still he's there. there. Yeah, I can hear you. Marriage. Austin uh, totally. Uh, yeah, you. That was totally <laughs> me. You pretended to freeze. It was so obvious. No, no, no. Uh, uh, no, no. I, no, I, Austin, I, really, I really don't want government workers or bureau, bureaucrats um, doing social work or anything of the sort. I really don't think the government needs to be involved in our communities, other than to simply uh, not even to build the roads. Um, uh, really, just to you know. I, not even police, not even like, so we can even have some private arbitration. You know, maybe maybe if the government is to exist, it should do those things that it had in the original constitution in many ways, which was to uh, provide a lawyer to people who are accused of crimes, poor people who cannot afford lawyers who are accused of crimes. You know, maybe es establish you know a, a president and a legislation, and a le legislative branch, and a judiciary, and simple you know to solve simple pro uh, oh. problems. All right, and, and that's Kevin, about it. the that's same really question. I mean, I think, and to my point, I think a lot of these things, the state interventions in the social field, are where a lot where a lot of the balkanization and, uh, um, and division has come from, for obviously political purposes, to basically grow the state. I think if these were left largely to market principles, people work together to serve one another. I think the market handles this. It's not a central planning issue. Okay, so go go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, and and what is the market? When how how does the market replace these things? And did the market actually take care of these things back in say the 1800s, when uh, the government was not involved with with you know social the social field and um, you know orphans and so forth of course it did there was you know there was charity there was uh there was a lot of ways that the that people took care of each other before the government took over and is the government doing a better job now it's tough to say because you look at the 1800s and a lot of a lot of what happened there wasn't as much productivity back then there wasn't as much wealth so regardless if it comes from the government or if it comes from the private sector there wasn't as, as much to go around Today, there's a lot more to go around. If we eliminated government or eliminated these sectors of government, I think you'd probably have a lot more in the private sector that would be able to take care of each other. Would they? Well, that's the question. I think they would. Would you guys take care of each other? Would you guys uh, Would you guys go out and you know contribute to, to. to charity? Don't make me. If I don't want of to, I won't. You, I'll do what I want. Exactly. That's right. But if you have the money to do it, are you going to do it? Of course you are. I would. I help people all the time. You know, I don't go out and start posting right. about it and telling the world about it. You know, I got a lot of people who rely on me. You know, who who you know ask me for help for their own lives, and and I do that because I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, not because no. By the way, I thinks, need some help. Uh -oh. Yes, you do because Here. you just disappeared. All right, it's the Austin Peterson and Will <laughs> Ricciardi. So he's no. back, thank God. Oh, he's back, he's back, wow. damn it. Look at that. That's a mug only a mother oh, could love God. right there. All right. Um, <laughs> my mom here's uh, mug. the that's next you. question. I want to get to this one. I think it's a facetious question. I think Actually, it is one. Don't you guys realize that government programs aren't working because government oh, yeah. has only $3 trillion to work with? If we just gave them more money, we'd have utopia and basic income for all, right? One, what is basic income? <laughs> One, but this troll. is a good question a because troll. you hear a lot of this rhetoric from, from the left. And you hear, you know, a living yeah. wage, quote unquote, basic income. Um, you know, whenever, some, whenever a, pro, a government program doesn't work, it's always we need more spending. And people buy this stuff. I, I, is it be, what do you think, it, Austin, do you think it's a lack of knowledge and market principles? Or do you think it's just a, a, a over, I don't know, maybe perhaps uh, misguided compassion? What do you think it is when, that people buy this rhetoric? They're stupid. That's <laughs> the best argument against it. What was Will, the Winston Churchill quote, the best argument against democracy yeah. is a five-minute conversation <laughs> exactly. with the average voter? I mean, you know. That's why I'm. That's why I am for a republic, a a constitutional republic, uh, with a with aspects of 
representative democracy. You know, we we should vote exactly. for the people to vote for us. We really should. It's it's probably the best way to do it. You know, people th there's there's not always wisdom in crowds, but the type of people who show up to vote for things like caucuses right. and electoral colleges tend to be a more right. informed. Uh, yeah, crowd. Uh, and they to do. your point, a we are supposed to be a constitutional republic, but we haven't been one in a while. Not, I mean. No real official, certainly the judiciary, the executive lately, and historically have Who respected says? the Constitution. We're not a federal republic. No one respects federalism. We're not a representative republic. These guys pass bills that are 17,000 pages. What do you mean no one yeah. respects federalism? Yeah. I mean, they pass Come bills on, in the middle Alex. of the night that nobody can read. Yeah. Who are they representing? They don't respect... You know, I don't... We're, we've really lost our way. What do you think, Kevin? Don't make me de don't make me defend. They don't the respect right federalism. <laughs> I mean, it, um, the, certainly yeah. the uh, the incorporate. So what? I I wouldn't respect federalism either if I thought the states were being anti-libertarian. Um, federalism is only a means to an end. It's like nationalism or any other concept. You know, when when Jim Crow laws were rampant across the South, the federal government disrespected federalism and moved in and and crushed the uh, the Jim Crow laws. When when the slaveholding states of the South refused to give up their slaves, the, the federal government did not respect federalism and it crushed the rebellion. Good for the federal government because I don't give a damn whether there is a thousand tyrants one mile away or one tyrant a thousand miles away, as paraphrased from the Patriot. Uh, I only care uh, from a consequential standpoint about whether or not liberty is advanced. So federalism to me seems like a good idea. I like the idea of laboratories of democracy. But uh, the so federal you, system is there so would you also, to act would you, as a check and balance. Remember, they, remember when they created the legislature, when they created the legislature, it was very important, they created a bicameral system. The founders created a bicameral system, not right. one Senate, not one body politic, but two to, to play off of one another. And it was the same way with the federal government right. between the federal the government and the states would state be represented through their ambassadors. That was abolished in the 17th Amendment of the progressive movement that you mentioned, which killed federalism and consolidated government, consolidated tyranny in a sense. I prefer to have tyranny relegated to a smaller geographic area than the entire United States. I prefer New York to be... Go ahead, Kevin. Well, that's... Yeah. That's the point. That's the point. Is that the smaller, the smaller the governing body is, right. the, the more effective it is. And you can go all the way from a dictatorship of one, and you go down to a, uh, the the federal government of of 300, 400 legislators. You go down to a state. You, you and keep going down. What do you what what do you end up with? I mean, if, is it more? If you keep going smaller and smaller, does it become more effective? And what does that tell you about? The government just, that we should be I considering to run us. I mean, you keep getting smaller. What's what's the what's the most effective? Well, who's making who's most effective at making decisions for your family? Is it somebody in Washington? I mean, these are obvious things. I'm not saying everybody who's who's watching us right now knows the answer to this. Keep getting keep your keep getting your smaller smaller and smaller government until you get down to the individual or the family size, and pretty much that's the person that is making the best decisions for your family is your family now the the further up we get be it state or federal the right. worse the decisions become because they don't know you as I well mean, yeah, I mean, to these that, are to obvious point, things there's no way to like to eradicate tyranny to eradicate usurpers you can just mitigate it as best you can and i see federalism as a as a system of mitigating uh tyranny um we need I want to get a question from Julie Borowski here because she's she's got something over here. She's talking about uh, uh, leave it to the states is often a cop out. It was on the same thing, um, and we've gone over on time, so I assume that we how about a little anarchy here for a moment. Julie says uh, that leave it to the states is a cop out. That's that's true. You know, uh, I think sometimes what happens is that we've sort of been sold a bill of goods from conservatives who believe in states' rights, but what is very important to remember is that states do not have rights. States have powers, only right, but powers. people are best. Only people, people best people protect rights. those rights on the and local level. I can't. I can't call up Nancy Pelosi and tell her not to, you know, not to pass Obamacare. But I'd have a better chance at the local level to do that. Yeah. That's what you I can. mean. I, I mean, I'm Jeff. I'm totally Jeffersonian. Well, some of those problems. Some of those problems, in my opinion, are from. 
Uh, some of those problems have to do with the passage of the 17th. Exactly, that's my point. It crushed the federalism Amendment, through, but, the, uh, through the 16th but, um, and 17th Amendments, uh, through the progressive movement. Not only that, through the incorporation doctrine of the 14th agree, Amendment has crushed Absolutely. states' rights. Um, we have this fundamental rights doctrine, which gives uh, the judiciary carte blanche to write laws and impose them on people that don't want them. It's entirely, not only is it not a constitutional republic, that's not even a democracy. That's a judicial oligarchy. We've really lost our way here. And I think just getting back, if we can't agree on federalism, uh, which is the Tenth Amendment, just getting back to the Constitution in some regard, some respect, would be would be a huge plus. Uh, I, I'm sure we could agree with that on that, Austin, just getting back to the Constitution Man. and a constitutional republic. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Abolish yeah. the 16th what you, Amendment. What do you think, Kevin, the other than the fact Amendment. that, you know, you and, need to... Uh, yeah. Oh, those are very easy. I mean, these are very easy things to do. Um, you know, if, if Rand Paul wins, then all these things will be taken care of. Uh, the, the system Article will secure, five, everybody. Everything will take care of itself. That's why, that's why, Austin, I'm not a downer, Austin. I'm just saying it's going to take baby steps, and I think people need to absolutely have a realistic goal in mind if they want to really yeah. change the system. Right. Being realistic is staying. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. And I mean, you know, I don't know. Just I think the Jeffersonian methodology of getting back to people at the local level, letting and, not, and I'm not talking about usurping other people's rights. Does anybody like wish that the South had actually does anybody actually wish the South had won the Civil War? I mean, like, how would you like to have to like show a passport to drive from New York City to Florida to go yeah, like, you know, I mean, play on the beach? And but you have to look at it. Had America this... not amazing and beautiful? Had the South not rebelled, they wouldn't have had a problem with Lincoln. The only way Lincoln emancipated the slaves is because the South rebelled. Therefore, he took their property from them. And, you know, you have the uh, Good. clause in the Constitution that says that, that was Absolutely. based on uh, unless an insurrection or rebellion. I can't remember the entire thing right now. But they, they rebelled. He That's took right. their property. You had That's the right. Fugitive Slave Acts in well, what, 1850, what which the, the judiciary argument? passed again. Uh, you had Dred Scott in 1857. These things came from another branch of the federal government um, that, that really were the impetus for the Civil War. And you had the North. It came at the state's level uh, in the North. A lot of the, certainly with the Fugitive Slaves Acts, they saw the, 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 the horrors of the institution of slavery and they wanted to end it. When the states went into rebellion, that's when Lincoln took their, the, the, had the Emancipation Proclamation, which was years later. He wanted to do it at the right time. And uh, uh, yes. so basically the, 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 this... Right, brilliant move from a tactical standpoint. Correct. He had to keep the uh, right. British. He had That's to keep right. the British from and, coming and, in and on the side. And they, I mean, thank goodness he did that. Um, but I mean, uh, with a, you know, if the South basically sowed their own fate at that point, so they they were moronic. Well, they well they sowed it. They sowed it right. from the moment from the moment it began. You know, the the abolitionist movement Absolutely. began during the American Revolution. The the Declaration of Independence originally right. was an anti-slavery document right. before it was required to be changed. Uh, so the abolitionist movement, the people are like, oh, it had nothing to do with slavery. I'm like, well, yeah, well, except for the first hundred years before right. the Civil War might have something, might change your opinion on that. Um, so, you know, there right. is obviously a lot of reasons for the Civil War, yep. but the number one reason was slavery. And it was because people were not going to take it anymore. John, the, the, the raid on Harper's yep. Ferry, John Brown. So a lot of libertarians hate for some reason, uh, strangely. Uh, you know, he killed slavers, you know. Uh, so so the um, so the thing is, is that I think we have a bit of a problem here in the liberty movement where we have perhaps a bit of ignorance on history or maybe we've been sold uh, a bill of goods from revisionist historians who would like to uh, have us buy into a real confederate version of, of what happened. I mean, the slaveholding government of the South. It's, I think that that's disgusting. The slavery is a disgusting practice, and there's there's right. nothing about the Confederacy defensible. If you're an anti, if you're an anarchist, you should absolutely believe any new government that tries to squ that spring up, yeah. squash it, squash it as quickly as possible. Do we need more states? People are like secession. I'm like, why? So you can create your own tyrannical state? Yeah, Texas just secede. Yeah, so that they can execute 20 people a day instead of a yeah, month, I, you know? I mean, like, I agree yeah, with you to great. a certain extent, and you're right. Like, a lot of people, out of political expediency, cherry-pick history and take out points and leave out other points to, to further their ideological it goals. That, that's a really good point. I'd like to end that. I'd like to end the show on some that's agreement. That's correct. You know what I mean? I think we all agree there. I don't know what Kevin's doing. I think he's just drunk. You do, 
That figures. You're so I negative. Disagree. You're so negative all the time. Completely I just, disagree. You can't handle your negativity. Seriously. <laughs> anyway, um, I just want to remind everybody to uh, go to the Libertarian Republic. Um, it's a great website. A lot of interesting stuff. I love the Thomas Sowell. Oh yeah. I'm I just, know we are because we're, we're awesome. Going and we're way drunk. Over here right now. But I just want people to go. Mm. <laughs> Austin, you're yeah. blacked out. I just right want people now. to go to the Libertarian no Republic. You got a great is. piece on Thomas Sowell. That I think his ten best <laughs> uh, uh, anti-status quotes and Milton Friedman. Those are ec excellent pieces I read. Also, go to Unbiased America, which is a, another great um, little nice. Facebook page, as well as We Are Capitalists. They do a great job at We Are Capitalists. Um, the Analytical Conservative, another really great page, probably the best ever, best thing ever in the world. And then, um, did I miss anything? Being classically liberal, we all know those. And um, thanks for coming out. Austin, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it very much. Some good points. Good debate. Yeah, thanks. You have to yeah, come back again sometime. Come with you fellas. Probably when we fire Kevin, you can probably get a regular spot. <laughs> All right. And, Anytime, you know, fellas. Keep yeah. spreading the message. All right, Kevin, go to bed. You're drunk. All right. Thanks, guys. Right. Have a good night. Bye. <laughs>